the first thing we have to observe is the immense riches of Murshid's teachings. Very often that is not very realized for different reasons. People read, they are impressed, and still they very often do not uh, do not completely grasp everything Murshid has to give. And that is for two reasons. The first is that Murshid uses a very Indian way of uh, teaching, which, especially in his time in the West, was not familiar at all. Uh, that is, in India, the surface of any mode of expression, the surface of life, is very colorful, very playful, very kind of, you know, uh, yes, virtually like ein Spiel, a, a kind of play which is going on. Look at the Hinduism as a religion. There you have Sri, Sri Krishna as a child stealing the butter and, you know, all kind of very human things happen which make that religion very playful, very colorful. And uh, even the Indian Islam has copied some of that kind of kind of playful attitude in its music, in its verse, etc. So, and at the same time, that very colorful, very playful surface has a profound depth, a, a unique depth of spiritual awareness, of philosophical, philosophical uh, contemplation, etc. So, the playfulness on the surface and the profound depth of the inner reality go together. Now, that's, that's one thing, thing which in which the night's time in the West was completely unknown. That was the post-Wagnerian, let us say, tradition in Europe, where anything that was sacred, which was holy, which was deep, which was really value of ultimate value, had to be solemn from the at the surface as well. If it were not solemn at the first, at the surface, how could it possibly be uh, have any depth? Now, that was a thing which many people did not un understand. So, Murshid has that very playful way of enunciation, right? all kind of uh, things which he tells, and he tells all kind of stories, all kind of anecdotes. His whole style has that the Indian way of being very poetic and very evocative. And people are impressed, people like that evocativeness, they like that kind of poetic thing, but very often they do not realize how profoundly deep in a philosophical sense and in a, in, in a spiritual sense those texts really are. That's one thing we have to always be careful when we deal with Bush's text. The second thing is that these are spoken texts. And when you read them in a book, you tend you need to read as you read, well, I should not say a newspaper, but let us say a, a solid kind of book. And then you tend to read it for what is there. And there again, it again struck me the other day when we had Piazia read one of Murshid's lectures in one of our previous meetings, that when it is read in that way with a person of that kind of illuminative uh, con uh, concept and understanding of those texts, when you read them in that way, then those texts suddenly yield far more uh, when they are being read in that type, kind of way by that kind of person. Then you get that much more out of those texts than when you just read it in a book. So do not think that Moshe's teaching were completed by having the complete volumes of all his lectures and all his teachings available. That's fine. But they will have to be good continue reading in order to, for yourself. If you don't understand the passage, read it again, read it aloud to yourself. Certainly already you will notice that certain details and strands of it certainly become clearer and contain more than you would have expected. And so summer schools where these texts are read will always have be a necessity in order to get as close as possible to what Moshe intended to convey when he said what he said. So these two things, the, that Indian character of playfulness at the surface to match the depth of the inner vision, and at the same time the way of enunciation, which is a purely oral one, these two things have always taken into account when you approach Moses' teachings. <laughs>